Our next clinical pearl is going to be about the most commonly diagnosed cancer in Australia, prostate cancer. Hopefully, by the end of this video, we'll be able to reinforce what we know about its screening. Research suggests that prostate cancer screening does not save lives. Screening of asymptomatic men, in particular, by prostate-specific antigen testing is not recommended. Therefore, GPs have no obligation to offer prostate cancer screening to asymptomatic men. Other scientists, however, argue that most patients with prostate cancer are asymptomatic. Other scientists say that not testing men even when they're beyond 70 years old means missed or delayed diagnosis as the disease has already progressed to a more aggressive or metastatic stage. By the time they present in the clinic, it's already too late for a cure. With all these nuances, prostate screening remains to be a topic for debate until now. Current guidelines state that asymptomatic men, whether they are at risk or not, are not recommended to be screened because the benefits have not clearly been shown to outweigh the harms. They should first undergo an informed process and when a man agrees that he has understood the benefits and harm of the procedures, it's only then that requests for prostate cancer screening are made. A PSA blood test is acceptable, but elevation in PSA is nonspecific, as other conditions can also increase its value. Most of these are actually due to non-cancerous conditions such as prostatitis and benign prostatic hyperplasia. This then leads to overdiagnosis and overtreatment that eventually increases the incidence of adverse effects of certain treatments. Digital rectal examination, on the other hand, is no longer recommended as it is insufficiently sensitive to detect prostate cancers early enough. If either of these tests suggest an abnormality, other tests are necessary to confirm a diagnosis. Usually, a magnetic resonance imaging scan and transrectal ultrasound biopsy is done. This holds true whether the man is of low, average, or high risk. If a man is asymptomatic, then he is low risk. If he is more than 75 years old, or the life expectancy is less than 10 years old, then he is classified as average risk. When the man has more than one first-degree relative who is less than 65 years old, or a first-degree relative with BRCA, then he is classified as high risk. It is strongly advocated, however, that screening should be done for men at an earlier age who have strong positive family history of prostate cancer. In essence, guidelines suggest that we only do PSA testing for appropriate selected men. Here's the risk stratified recommendations based on the European Association of Urology. First is to ensure prostate cancer awareness among men. Next is to counsel men on the benefits and harms of prostate specimen antigen testing. To offer an individualized risk adopted strategy for early detection to men aged more than 50 years with a life expectancy of more than 10 years. To offer early PSA testing to men with an elevated risk of having prostate cancer, such as men aged more than 45 years with a family history of prostate cancer, more than 45 years from high risk ethnicities, more than 40 years old carrying BRCA2 gene mutations. Where African American men are said to be at higher risk than Caucasian men. And lastly, limit testing when life expectancy suggests unlikely benefit. Prostate cancer is only curable when localized to the prostate. Depending on the risk category, the type of management is determined. Risk assessment de depends on the PSA, stage, and Gleason score. For low risk, PSA cutoff is less than or equal to 10, and for high risk, it is more than 20. For the tumor stage, here's the diagram of a prostate adjacent to the seminal vesicles. T1 is when the tumor is impalpable. T2 is when the tumor is palpable and confined within the prostate, which can further be subcategorized to T2A when the tumor involves one half of one side or less. 
T2B tumor involves more than one half of one side but not both sides. And T2C is when the tumor involves both sides. Remember that T2A is the cutoff for low-risk patients and T2C is the cutoff for high-risk patients. T3A is when the tumor is already outside the capsule and T3B is when it has already infiltrated the seminal vesicle. Again, the cutoffs for low risk is T1 to T2A. For high risk, it is 2C and beyond. Now, the histological grade or Gleason score is determined from the morphology of the glandular components of the biopsies. The cutoffs are less than or equal to 6 for low risk and more than or equal to 8 for high risk. The management for each patient is individualized. Generally, active surveillance may be done among low risk patients, but note that they require PSA monitoring. A significant change is when a PSA has doubled within less than three years from the time of detection and a planned repeat biopsies at 6 to 12 months from diagnosis must also be done then every three to four years thereafter. For localized lesions, radical prostatectomy, external beam radiotherapy, and brachytherapy are used. The most common complications of Radical prostatectomy include retrograde ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, and urinary incontinence in decreasing incidence. Meanwhile, external beam radiotherapy tends to be favored for the older patient, predominantly because of the risk of late radiation-induced second malignancies. Complications include fecal urgency, diarrhea, and urine frequency. Brachytherapy, which employs seed implants that has very short radiation range, are restricted to men with a much more localized lesion, particularly those with low risk of extracapsular cancer extension. Lastly, ADT or androgen deprivation therapy is a cornerstone of treatment for locally advanced and metastatic prostate cancer. It could be done surgically by bilateral orchidectomy or medically by using antiandrogenic medications like cyproterone and flutamide, luteinizing hormone-releasing hormone agonists like goceralin and luproralin. Combined orchidectomy and flutamide are proven to prolong the life of these patients. Side effects include menopausal symptoms, impotence, metabolic syndrome, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, neuropsychological effects, and loss of bone and muscle density. As we've now realized, there are a lot of complications from these therapies that are needed to be discussed with the patients. Now let's try answering the STEM. A 67-year-old man presents for follow-up for prostate cancer surveillance. He's asymptomatic, but his father has been diagnosed of prostatic adenocarcinoma. On DRE, prostate is enlarged and regular. His previous PSA was 2 nanograms per ml, and after a year, is currently noted to have PSA of 3.2 nanograms per ml. Transrectal ultrasonography-guided biopsy of the prostate was found to have a Gleason score of 4. What is the management for this patient? A. Radical prostatectomy B. Watchful waiting C. Orchidectomy D. Continue surveillance or E. External beam radiotherapy Note that the repeat PSA is still less than 10. It has not significantly increased and the Gleason is less than 6, which makes this patient low risk. Again, the cutoffs are the following. And a significant increase in PSA is twice of that value in less than 3 years. A. Radical prostatectomy is incorrect. B. Watchful waiting is totally different from active surveillance, 
where you do not perform any tests and just wait for the disease to progress, which is unacceptable in this case. C is too aggressive for this case who is asymptomatic with unremarkable lab findings. D is definitely the answer. E is also incorrect. I hope you got the answer. If not, you can always replay or review so that come the actual AMC exam, you'll be confident to choose the right option. Next question. What's the latest update on HPV immunization? Do we need to prescribe additional doses? The answer coming up on our next video. Music